بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين الحمد لله we've had the honor of really hearing of so many of our wonderful and blessed mothers of the believers our sahabiyat our women role models and now inshallah we're going to hear of yet another one today inshallah I'm going to share with you about Baraka Baraka bin Thalaba otherwise known as Umm Ayman and as I tell you a little bit about her life, there is something very unique about her that no other, not just no other woman, no other person in history has been able to accomplish or is, can claim that this is something, you know, for them. This is unique to Baraka. But I'm not going to tell you what that is because inshallah you're going to listen very intently <laughs> and tell me at the very end what that is. Now, Ustaz of Husayna at the very beginning shared with us about Sumayya. That was the very first lecture today. And she said there were three characteristics. Let me test you a little bit. Just a little quiz here. What were the three characteristics of Sumayya, radiallahu anha, that she said at the very beginning about her? She was? Wow, mashallah, amazing. She was Abyssinian. She was 20 years older than the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa And she was? A slave. Tamam. You were listening. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> now, Baraka, who we're going to talk about here, shares almost all the same characteristics, one slight difference. Like Sumeya, she's also from Abyssinia. We don't know a lot about her roots, her parents, or her lineage, but we know that she's Abyssinian. We also know that she was a slave. And we also know that she was older than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but not quite as old as Sumeya. She was probably something like 10 years or less older than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Some narrations, they don't have exact numbers. They say maybe six, seven, eight, somewhere in that range, less than 10 years older than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So here's what we know. And make sure you're keeping track. Keep track with me all the dates and times as we talk about them, and also keep track of the special, unique characteristic about her as we go on. So what we do know, in terms of being a servant, a slave, which in that period of time in history was the norm. Of course, Islam is going to come later and abolish this, slowly but surely, and we'll see this directly in her own life. But in that period of time, slavehood was common, and she was in the household of whom? Who? Whose household was she part of? Huh? Before? No. Maybe somebody said, yes, somebody said it. Abdullah. Who's Abdullah? The father of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she was in his household, taking care of him, serving him, yeah? As a servant may in a household. And what we know is that once he married, who? Amina, right? The mother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Baraka continued to follow him to that household where he was married to Amina, and she served Sayyida Amina as well. Now the story goes, and so much of the life of Sayyida Amina, the mother of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we know, actually is directly narrated by Baraka herself, because she was the one in the household. In fact, she says many times she was the only one in the household. So, so much about Amina's pregnancy and her entire time being pregnant with the Prophet وسلم, and delivery, a lot of it's narrated by Baraka herself. So what do we know about her? Here's what we know. We know, for example, that she was treated very kindly, unlike most slaves, by Abdullah, the father of the Prophet وسلم, and by Amina. And that when she, uh, within a couple of weeks of marriage, Abdullah was called by his father. Who's his father? Abdul Muttalib, right? The grandfather of Prophet ﷺ, and asked to go with to go to a caravan to Syria. Amina was upset. She said, I'm just a few weeks married, and my husband's going to leave. And he did in fact go with the caravan following his father's orders, and she was alone. Baraka says, I was with her. I took care of her. And she became so sad that she was bedridden. She didn't want to leave the bed. So Baraka served her. 
and she said she would sleep right at the foot of her bed so that if she was needing anything at all, she would help her and nurture her and take care of her. This is really important because it's a very close, close relationship. And in this period of time, Amina is really sad, and she talks about that. But then one night, she wakes up, and she's so excited, so excited, and she's just beaming with joy, something like you haven't seen before. And so Baraka is narrating the story. And she says, Amina woke up and she said, Baraka, I had the strangest dream. And it's a beautiful dream. She said, I could see from my abdomen light. And the light is emanating. And everywhere I look from the east to the west, there is light everywhere. And so at this point, Baraka says to her, do you think you might be pregnant? And so she says, I don't feel pregnant. As women feel pregnant, they feel the physical difficulty of pregnancy. She said, I don't feel this way. But later she narrates, because she was asked this question again later, did you feel pregnant? And she said, I didn't even know why I was pregnant. And what she narrates is something really beautiful. She says, when I was between asleep and awakened state, I heard a voice say to me, you are carrying the leader of a nation. You are carrying the next prophet. And she kind of, you know, when you kind of hear something, you're startled by the voice, like, where did this come from? And she said she heard that in the beginning of her pregnancy, towards the beginning, and she heard that again at the very end, right before she delivered. The same voice. And she said that's how it was confirmed to me that I was pregnant, because I never felt pregnant the way other women may feel the pregnancy of the Prophet Muhammad So here she was pregnant and being taken care of by Barakah. And at one point, Abdul Muttalab, who continues to visit her, her father-in-law, continues to visit her, check on her, see how she's doing. He visits her and he says, you need to leave this area that we are. We are all leaving Mecca. We have to go into the hills, the mountains, to hide. Because news has reached to us that there is a leader from Yemen that has come and is going to destroy the Kaaba. Who is this? Abraha. News had reached them that Abraha and his whole army is coming to destroy the Kaaba. And she said, I'm too weak. I'm not able to leave this, this bed. So you could see Abdul Baraka narrates, you could see Abdul Muttalib getting kind of a little agitated, <laughs> like he wants his daughter-in-law and, and the baby that she's carrying to be safe. So he wants her to go. And so he, she says to him, she says, the Kaaba is protected by its Lord, and he will never reach the Kaaba. He will never even enter Mecca, she said. And so even though he was kind of upset and he wanted her to go, he let her be because she, he said to her himself, she's got a good point. <laughs> Allah will never let the Kaaba be destructed. SubhanAllah. So here she is continuing on. A couple months more, into this story, the people who had gone to the caravan to Syria started to return, little by little, little by little, and everybody's welcoming them, they're excited to have them back, it's an arduous journey, it's difficult. Baraka says she sneaks out, and she sees every time new people come, more people come back from the caravan, she's trying to figure out, is Abdullah with them, is Abdullah with them, did he come back? So that she can give news to Amina. He never seems to appear with any of the people who are coming back. Finally, she hears some whispering that he didn't actually make it. But she doesn't want to be the one to tell Amina. So she waits until finally there is actually confirmation that on the way back from Syria, they stopped in Yathrib. What is the city that we today call Yathrib? Medina. His maternal uncles and aunts were in Medina. And he stopped there to visit them after the return of the caravan. But Medina also had a terrible illness that many people who were not from Medina would get sick when they would go. They'd get a fever. And with that illness, he had a fever. And after a month of battling with it, he actually passed away. And he was buried there in Yathrib. When the news came, Barakah happened to be in the house of Abdul Muttalib. And she heard it and she said, I screamed. I just, you know, like when you lose your, it just suddenly, it's something affects you suddenly. And she said, I can't even remember what I did. All I know is I have ran to Amina and I told her the news. And she said, at that point, Amina fainted. And so here she is, pregnant, 
with the news of her husband who's just, just newlyweds. And she's going to now raise this baby that's in her womb alone. And not only that, but it's you know, shocking to your system altogether. And so now, Baraka says, at this point, I continue to nurse her and help her and take care of her as she was continuing the rest of her pregnancy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send, sent beautiful messages to Amina all throughout the pregnancy. There were all these signs and things that were happening that she was carrying in her womb, some, someone who was very, very important. And this helped comfort her throughout this very difficult period of time. Now, Baraka says that she continued to take care of her until the baby was delivered. And on that night, she was the very first person to hold the baby. She was the very first one to hold the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she witnessed so many miracles that she narrates. There were other women there too, she wasn't the only one. For example, you have, for example, other women who were there that particular night, and they narrate some beautiful stories from that night. Remember the dream that Amina had about light that she saw everywhere? That night, all of the women who were there, who were helping in the delivery process, they too could see light emanating. Amina herself said, I could see light that lit up the entire, all the hills and mountains of Mecca. I could see so far from this light. And other women talked about how the stars were so bright, it was so low as though they were going to fall right in your lap. SubhanAllah. And there were other really amazing signs that not just happened in that room, in that house that was where the Prophet was delivered, but also throughout other countries and other nations. Like they talk about, for example, in Persia, how the emperor there, there was a flame, there was a fire that was being kept in Persia for over a thousand years, and that night it went out. And how in the castles of some of the rulers as far out on either side of the world, parts of their buildings crumbled. Now people didn't know because later they were going, later they kind of connected all the stories together and they found that it was on the birth night of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Jewish people of Mecca and Medina, especially from Medina side, they knew that someone special, in fact in their books it said that this particular star when it emerged, that means Ahmed was born. And they knew the next prophet was named Ahmed, but they didn't know who he was going to be, whom he was going to be, what family he was going to be born into. And so when no one was born on they, their side, they went to Quraysh and said, did anyone get born on your side? And at first they didn't know. And eventually when they heard news, it was Amina who had a baby that night. There were these amazing narrations where they said to them, we're so sad. Because it means prophecy was taken out of Bani Israel and has now went to Quraysh. They knew. At least the early ones did. And so there were so many, we can go on and on in the seat of the Prophet ﷺ about the amazing miracles of his birth and of that night. Back to Baraka, she talks about how not only was she there to help with the actual birthing process of the, of the Prophet ﷺ, but also his first few hours and days, and especially in the beginning as they decided and tried to figure out who would be his wet nurse. And you know the story of Hanima. So we'll, inshallah, another day come to that story because you know it, inshallah. But she wasn't, Baraka wasn't the wet nurse. She was the person who followed from his father's home, Abdullah, to his mother, to the shared married home of Abdullah and Amina. And now she's going to continue serving Amina as she now has this young baby. But we know that the Prophet ﷺ for the next five years goes with Halima Sa'diya to the Bedou, to the Bedou right? for the fresh air and the beautiful Arabic tongue that he would learn, and so on and so forth. And in those five years, Baraka stayed back with Amin and she took care of her onward. Always there, always in the background, always taking care. Now, five years pass, and there's an incident that happens that we won't go into in much detail, but you all know the incident. What is the incident that Halima, even though she really wanted to keep the Prophet ﷺ well past his nursing days, because of how much barakah, how much blessings he brought that household. She, what is the incident that brought him back when she rushed back to give him back to his mother? Yes, the incident in which his brother, actually his, in, by nursing, saw two men come and 
open up the open up the chest of the Prophet ﷺ and do something. <laughs> it was terrifying to him, right? He came back and his face was all as pale, you know, ashen, terrified of what happened. And at this point, Halima said, I can't take responsibility for something like this happening. And she rushed him back to his mother and the mother asked what happened. And she said, oh, I'm just giving him back. <laughs> and she said, you were so insistent on keeping him. What happened? And so she told the story. And this is the beautiful thing, not just of the mother, Amina, but the, the firmness of faith, the same thing when she said, Abraha will never be able to reach the Kaaba, and of course he never did. The same thing happened here, where she said, no harm will ever come to someone who Allah has protected. Right? She's, she's very firm about this. So the Prophet is returned to her household, and Barakah says how excited she was that the Prophet Muhammad is now back in their household, and she can take care of him again, along with his mother. Now this is at year five. One year later, at year six, is when Amina decides that he's, the Prophet ﷺ is old enough to go visit the grave of his father. So she's going to travel from Mecca to Yathrib, which Medina was then called as we talked about, Yathrib. And they went to Yathrib. And Abdul Muttalib tried to tell her, and Barakah tried to tell her, there's a fever there, don't go there, people get sick there. But she really wanted to visit the grave of her husband. So she went. And the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ went as well, and so did Barakah. Barakah said the entire journey that took 10 days, she carried the Prophet ﷺ, right, the six-year-old, and the entire time he was holding on to her, <laughs> and the entire ride. When they arrived there, the Prophet's maternal aunts and uncles are in Yathrib. So the Prophet talks about staying with them, and they stayed about a month. Every day, Amina would leave and go visit the graveyard, and then she'd come back and visit the graveyard and come back. And this was her journey for about a month. When the month passed, now it's time for them to go back to Mecca. Halfway through the trip, she gets sick with that fever. And she falls really sick. And they're in a halfway point between Mecca and Medina. Anyone know what that city is called? Abwa, yeah. And so she's there, and Baraka talks about taking care of her. And so she's taking care of this very sick person, subhanAllah, and there's a, like, a six-year-old boy. And one day, she got so sick, the mother, Amina, got so sick that she whispered into Baraka's ears and she said, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die here. I'm asking you to take care of my son. Never leave him from your sight. So Baraka is trying to muster up all of her courage and she promises her that she will take care of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And sure enough, that day she dies. And Baraka talks about how she herself, with her own bare hands, dug out from the sand a grave for Amina. She said her tears moistened the very sand with which she was digging the grave. And she herself buried Amina in this grave in Abwa. And then, now she has a six-year-old boy that she promised her mother, the mother that she would take care of. Now, it's not a small thing to go from where she was back to Mecca completely alone. There is a caravan, but she's completely alone in charge of this little boy. How old is Baraka? Does anyone know at this stage how old she is? Oh, good. So there's some guesses. There's various guesses, we don't have an exact age, but what we know is that she was definitely no older than a teenager. Definitely no older than a teenager. Some, the earliest say maybe a 12, 12 years old. Others say maybe she was a little older of a teenager, but no older than that. So this is a massive responsibility that now you're in charge of a six-year-old, not only to return him back to safety, but he is the pride of Quraysh. His father was the pride of Quraysh, and Amina was the Sayyida of Quraysh. She brings him back, first to his grandfather, and who takes him in, and Barakah stays there too. Because anywhere the Prophet goes, she's going to go. This is her son. She feels that Amina told her, this is your son, you're going to take care of him. And for some period of time, he's with the grandfather, then as you know, the grandfather passes away, and where does he go? to his uncle, who? Abu Talib. And Baraka follows along. So how many households has she been part of? Hmm. 
right? Everywhere, essentially, the Prophet goes, she goes. Now, the Prophet ﷺ lives in the household of Abu Talib until he becomes a young man. Until the story that you might remember from an earlier conference when we talked about Sayyidah Khadija and how he stayed actually in the household of his uncle until he married Sayyidah Khadija. And Baraka is right along with him, inshallah, <laughs> this entire time. Now, when he gets married to Sayyidah Khadija, he's going to move into Sayyidah Khadija's house. Who comes with him? <laughs> Baraka. But here's something different happens. Now, he finally has, remember, he didn't come from wealth. He's an orphan. His family is well off, a beautiful lineage. But the house he was in, Abu Talib, was not a wealthy house, old. And he worked as a shepherd, you might remember. You might remember the story from the previous conference that when, the, when a friend of Sayyidah Khadija, her cousin friend, came to ask about her, and she said, oh, Muhammad, why aren't you married yet? And he said, I don't have the means. Right? And she said, well, what if the person was smart and beautiful and wealthy? And you didn't have to worry about that. He said, who's that? <laughs> and she said, I'll take care of it, mashallah. <laughs> and so this, this, by the way, we said this at the last conference, this is the importance of not doing this on your own, of having trusted friends and people to actually help you in this process, even if you're the one who's asking someone else's hand in marriage as a woman. And so here we are. Now he finally has, he's standing on his own two feet, right? He's now a married man and able to, the, able to have his own finances. And so the very first thing he does is he frees Barakah. He says, I don't want you to be a slave. You have your freedom completely. Despite that, Baraka says, I want to live with you. She says, how does, a, how does a mother let go of her son? And so she moves in to the household, even as a freed woman, into the household of Khadija and the Prophet ﷺ. Now let me tell you something. In that other conference, you might remember we talked about Khadija and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised her paradise and there was a very specific language in the Qur'an and what, she's, what in paradise she's promised. Does anyone remember that? I know I'm quizzing you from like a while ago. What is it? I guess? Yes, but what, about, what, what specifically? What's the language of it? Anyone remember? Yes, Allahu Akbar, you remember, Allahu Akbar. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some of the tafsir explanations say that, there's, that in this majestic castle that she's going to be given in Jannah, there is no toil or trouble. And some of the mufassirin say it also means there was no noise. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why the no noise? What was happening in the household of Khadija? How many people were in that household? Let's count. You have... We talked about Khadija, you have her own family, because Khadija was twice married and twice widowed before the Prophet Muhammad She had her own children. And at that point in time, at least Hind was there. Okay, who else? When the Prophet gets married to Khadija, he also brings some people along. Who does he bring? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Who else? Baraka, yes. Who else? Zayd ibn Haritha, mashallah, the adopted, if you will, son of the Prophet In fact, that's what he was called. He was called Zayd ibn Muhammad for the longest time, right? Until the verse came down and explained that adoption is different in Islam. And then you have all the children who Khadija is going to bear for the Prophet And how many were they? Huh? There were six in total. Two of the sons, of course, as we know, died in infancy. Four daughters. How many people are in that household? Allah, someone said a lot. <laughs> there were a lot of people in the household. A lot of young people in that household. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to her, you are promised no noise. <laughs> we know what he's talking about. Subhanallah. But all these people, people always talk about today, we talk about blended families. You want to see a blended family that's living so beautifully. You have step people, you have fostered people, you have adopted people, you have biological people, you have all kinds of blending happening in this family. And it is said it was the most peaceful and happy home in all of Mecca. Really, something to study, truly, and to learn about family dynamics. Another day for another time, inshallah. But as we go, keep going here, Baraka is living in this household, and she's so happy. One day, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Sayyidah Khadija say to her, 
and, and let's think about well, how old do you think when this story happens? They say to her, you're getting a little bit older now. Why don't you get married and settle down? Right? You've served me so long and served my family so long. How about you have your own family? And she said, who am I going to marry? Oh, Rasulullah. And so he introduces he, the idea of someone who had come to ask for her. Anybody know who? Hmm, little Sita quiz here. Hmm? Maybe? Albaid. Yes. She married Albaid ibn Zaid. And they had a son. The son's name was Ayman. This is why Baraka's other name is Umm Ayman. So sometimes in the, in the Sira, you'll see her written as Baraka, and sometimes you'll see it as Umm Ayman. Now, unfortunately, Ubaid died very soon after their marriage. So it didn't actually last very long because he died very soon thereafter. So here she is with Ayman. Once her husband dies, she's like in her 30s at this point, whose household does she go back to? Right back to the Prophet But this time she brings Ayman along. So even more people coming back into the household of the Prophet She says, this is my household. Every time something happens, she's right back to the Prophet to be there because she loves being there. So at this point in time, now, very soon after this story, you have the revelation comes to the Prophet how old was the Prophet when he received revelation? How old would she have been? What did we say? No, she's older. Uh, yeah, that, not maybe 50 or not quite 50. Maybe, yeah, about seven, eight years or so older than him. So she's not a young person. And within those first few years, Dar al arkam where they were meeting and talking about Islam in those early years, was very dangerous. And she would risk her life often to go there and especially to, exist, to bring news about what the mushrikeen were doing. And so she often actually put her life on the line. And one of these nights where she really could have lost her life, the Prophet ﷺ thanked her. And then as, when she left, he turned to his sahaba and he said, if any of you want to marry a woman of Jannah, marry Umm Ayman. Hmm. How old did we say she was? Yeah, close to 50. Who came forward? Hmm. Who? Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha came forward. What's the age difference? Ah. Well, let's count. If she's about 50, yeah, he was at least, they say, at least 20 years younger. So it wasn't just the Prophet Muhammad and Sayyidah Khadija that had the big age gap. What's their age gap? No, 15. 15 years, yeah. And what's the age gap between Zayd bin Haritha and Umm Ayman? Baraka? About 20. When people say these funny ideas, all these weird cultural norms that we sometimes have of it can't be like this and it can't be like that and they can't be younger and they can't be older or the first sibling can't get married until the second one can't get married until the first sibling gets married and... It's a little exhausting, honestly. <laughs> and we say, what about our early examples? Zayd bin Haritha said, Oh Rasulullah, I will marry her. He said, because he just heard the Prophet say she is a woman of Jannah. He said, she will be better than anyone who is younger, more beautiful, or comes from a better lineage. Because we don't know her roots. Right? And the Quraysh, they were very particular about their lineage and roots. Right? SubhanAllah. And sure, sure enough, Zayd bin Haritha married Umm Ayman and they had a son. What was the son's name? This is an important, very important, oh, they're all important, <laughs> very important here though. Who? Osama bin Zayd. Now, the Prophet ﷺ would say about Zayd himself, he would call him his beloved. And so when his son was born, Osama, what do you think Osama's name became? The beloved of the beloved of Rasulullah. Isn't that beautiful? The beloved of the beloved of Rasulullah. I mean, high, high status that these people had, ya subhanAllah. And he too grew up in the household of the Prophet wasallam. Why? Because Zayd was already there. <laughs> so was Barakah. And so therefore, so was Usama. Literally raised and nurtured in the household of the Prophet wasallam. SubhanAllah. So then we move forward, inshallah, on in the story here. And we continue here. And now you have 
and I didn't say this earlier, but I want to say this, that every time the Prophet ﷺ would talk to Umm Ayman, he would call her Ya Ummi. Like that was his name for her. Oh, my mother, Ummi. So beautiful, subhanAllah. And so, um, some beautiful things about her that you should know, that whenever it is that anyone asked her about how she was doing, she would say, her, 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 her line that she always say is, I'm fine as long as Islam is fine. She was so strong about it. She too went to the battlefields. She too nursed the ill on the battlefields. She too held strong and was always serving and nurturing, always from behind. SubhanAllah. Not in the limelight, not somebody would see and know, but guaranteed paradise and always serving. SubhanAllah. When the Prophet وسلم, passed away, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar went to her because they knew that she was in the maqam or the place of the mother of the Prophet وسلم. He would call her Ya Ummi. And so they went to give her condolences, knowing that how sad she must be. When they entered in to see her and to give her their condolences, they found her crying, tears in her eyes. And so they tried to console her and say, no, no, the prophets, you know, you know with Allah, th th this is Allah's decree, this is better, this is, you know, they were, they were trying to figure out what to say <laughs> to what would be like the mother of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so she stopped them immediately. And she said, that's not why I'm crying. She said, I'm not crying because the prophet died. She said, by Allah, I knew the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would die. That's not why I'm crying. We all knew one day he would die. Why I'm crying is because now that he is dead, revelation, wahi, has ended for all of us. That's why she was crying. And so they said, we came in to console her for her crying. We started crying along with her. <laughs> and she started to console us. SubhanAllah. Can you imagine being in that room with those amazing people who were the closest to the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam? So Barakah was not only somebody who was very close to the Prophet وسلم, and essentially part of his household, but when someone is that close to someone so beloved, they can't bear much longer after they die. And so a lot of the you know, narrations say that it was only months, five, six months perhaps after the Prophet's death that she, death, that she too passed away. Some say it was in the Khalafa of Sayyidina Uthman, which is soon thereafter. So now that I've shared this part with you, I want you to walk through this timeline with me. How many households was she part of that the Prophet was part of? How many did you count? Yeah. Count with me. Which ones? The house of Abdullah. The house of Amin and Abdullah. The house of Abdul Muttalib. The house of Abu Talib. The house of Khadija and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. And? And I guess you could say when they moved from Mecca to Medina, there was another home, of course, that, they, that she was part of. So what is it that's unique about her? What is it that no other human can claim? Oh, Allahu Akbar. Because some people were saying birth, but there were other people at the birth. And some people were saying, what? The death, but also some other people were at the death too. Huh, what's unique about her? She was literally the only, not woman, the only human who was with the Prophet وسلم, essentially from birth until death. No other person can claim that. No other person lived that long or lived through and was with him in all of those stages. Mecca and Medina and back and forth. Nothing. Nobody else. So when we say this is somebody who we have to take that kind of um, inspiration from, it truly is the case. And so as we would say that even though we don't know her roots and origins, other than that she was from Abyssinia, we know where she's going, to Jannah. And that's what matters. So with that, inshallah, I hope we reflect deeply on what that means to be in service of others, 
to be somebody who's constantly helping. Because it may not be that any one of us is necessarily our life, the way it ends up shaping up, is that we are in the forefront. You've heard of some of the others, but Sada Maria mentioned different, different tobias, different characteristics. Um Ayman was definitely someone who was much quieter and much more in the background, but there and always there. And absolutely carried Islam and helped carry Islam from the beginning until the death of the Prophet and her own death, the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah with that we'll close and I hope inshallah that inspires us to, to really be from any one of these women that you've heard, any one of them. The Prophet ﷺ said, my sahaba, my companions, and this is male and female, are like the stars. Ashabika nujum, ihtadaytu. Whoever it is that you seek guidance from to, to follow in their example, you, you will be guided. So I hope, inshallah, with all the people that we hear today, you find your star to guide you, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.